My name is Ancho Tekyar, and I'm the Vice President of the Indian Student Association at OU. Today, we've had the pleasure of, we're, we have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Pallab Ghosh. He's a professor of economics. Um, so Dr. Ghosh, he's a assistant professor of, in the economics department at OU before joining he graduated from Syracuse University in 2014. His research in interests include labor economics, eco econometrics, and development economics. So I think he, he will have some good insights into the specific problems that uh, students may have right now. And I, I think it's really interesting that he graduated re relatively recently, so he might know the specific problems of a grad student coming to the U.S. Um, and pursuing studies here. So I think uh, we have a good set of questions to ask him and then we'll open it up to the floor. A few rules that we have. So please stay muted for the beginning discussion. So for 15 to 20 minutes, I'll be talking with Dr. Ghosh with some prepared questions. Um, please stay muted so that the recording stays clear. Afterwards, we'll open it up to questions. So you can add, ask questions in the chat. Shireen will be uh, checking the chat and um, finding questions there. Um, and you can also unmute yourself and ask a question like that as well. So feel free to ask questions. This is a good time to clear your doubts about um, this kind of economy. Because as Dr. Ghosh was just saying, and right now, this is a a uh, really different time. So we'll uh, get started. So Dr. Ghosh, I just wanted to ask you, before we talk about the uh, economy and COVID, generally, what are the issues and uh, problems that a Indian grad student coming from India, usually pursuing engineering, data science, or something in STEM field or um, certain uh, humanity fields. What are what are their specific challenges, and what do they usually have to look out for once they graduate and go into the economy? Okay, okay. So I can I can talk about from my own experience. So so when you know you uh, study in, in India or or you know or, or some other countries like India, what we what we normally focus is to to have a good grade. That's yeah. that's what's always the main focus. Your parents always say that okay, study, study, study. You have to get a hundred out out of hundred in math. So this is uh, this is important. Obviously, this is important. But one thing we, we miss out a lot is about social skill. You know, this is so important these days. I wish I could show you some graph. These days, uh, when uh, you know, think about everyone have master degree. Okay. Think about everyone has the same master degree or, or even in engineering field. There are thousands of students are graduating you know, every year from the. We have the same thing, obviously, they're coming from different schools, but if your income or their wage or the salary right after the job will be so different, one of the main reasons is that uh, their interpersonal skill. This is so important these days. Uh, Actually, in the data, we can show that these days it's not about job, just math skill or you know quantitative skill that matters for a good job. Equally important is your social skill. So one thing uh, Indian students normally face difficulty. It's not about just Indian students. I, I would say Asians, Asians, you know, in general, uh, they find this difficulty is to sell themselves. I mean, some, suppose you are a very good engineer, you are a very good code, you can write code very well, but as long as you cannot sell yourself that well, uh, the employer may not know about your true ability. So okay. this is where students lack a lot, especially Asian students. And I want to point out this, you know, there is, I don't know how many of you have ever of this issue. Uh, some of, uh, there is an Asian student uh, association, they, uh, and they sue Harvard's Harvard, you know, this Harvard University uh, because there is a discrimination. They, they say that 
if you're an Asian student, you're less likely to get into Harvard because uh, you have to be you know, better than the others to get in, enrolled in Harvard. And, and then Harvard, there is, you know, there is a, in the, in Harvard is that it's not about just your, uh, you know, academic skill that matters to, to be successful in life. It is equally important that how well you can uh, work with other, you know, how well you can organize a group, how well, all those things, you know, you know those skills, leadership skill, if, if you call it, it's just a summary, summary word, that leadership skills matter so much. So uh, that's why, you know, um, one of the economists, uh, David Card, uh, say that this is not discrimination. Asian students uh, are not discriminating, uh, are, uh, Harvard is not discriminating Asian students because they are lacking this skill compared to others compared to other, other Indian students. So this is not a discrimination. If everything is same, if one person is chosen over other, then you, come, you can call this a discrimination. But since for Harvard, this matters so much, it's not about just academic skill, leadership skill matters so much. So, so I think this is where Asian students are lacking. So if, you, if you really uh, want to do well in this country, especially in America, it's not about just doing well in the exam. You have to uh, sell yourself you have to know how to sell yourself. This is uh, so important. It's, uh, there is many, many things, many, many things fall in that broad category, how to sell yourself. Mm -hmm. So you have to develop that skill. And this is where we are lacking a lot. Uh, it, is, it is because of our training. Since uh, maybe things are changing these days in India or some other countries, parents are more aware of this fact. At least for, in my generation, my, my parents, you know, didn't focus about this issue that much. It's all about having good, good grade, but this is not uh, sufficient to do really well, uh, do well in this type of economy, just about getting a good grade. Interesting. So you're saying, and that's a really interesting point. You're saying that not only is it like general advice, but there's data to back this, that uh, people with better interpersonal skills will get jobs quicker will get yes. a higher paying jobs right out of their programs. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are many papers showing that. Interpersonal yeah. skills are so important these days. So I think, and that's like, I think a general issue any Indian knows that if we generally are very good with our academics, our getting you know near the top of the class in our master's programs, you know, doing, publishing well, doing that, but maybe we aren't selling ourselves enough to the employers. Um, so selling yourself, you know, if you're an employer, you know, think about, you don't want to hire somebody, you know, who is academically brilliant, but that person cannot work with others. It's, it's undesirable for an employer to not have that first kind of person. So this is a really important. Uh, it's just not only about you know doing you know, well or you can you can do do a job because in, in in real life you always have to uh, work with others. If you cannot get along with people, if you are uh, creating so much problem in a group, this would be a thing. The entire group you're pulling down the entire group by by doing that. So, employer are very very uh, you know cautious about that. How well this person can get along with the people and, and do, do a good job for, for the farm or for the group. Yes. Very interesting. So uh, another thing that I think people generally talk about, even outside of COVID, is uh, when you're doing a master's program, when you're doing a PhD, you shouldn't, you should continue developing more skills. Sometimes people might talk about. Uh, doing a certificate on the side, maybe even doing another master's. What is your perspective on uh, pursuing additional education? And is there like a point of diminishing returns when adding extra certificates or something? As you're saying, many times personality factors play a big role. How important do you think it is, especially in an economy that's difficult right now, that you stay in school, versus go into the economy um, and actually go find a job. So what, what's your perspective on that? So if I understand the question well, uh, so you're saying that suppose you are, uh, 
you were engineering major so you were doing course related to engineering or uh, something under yeah, so sometimes maybe someone will do like a data science certificate or mm -hmm. sometimes they'll add another uh, master's so i'll do engineering then i'll do a master's in data science there's a lot of people who graduate with two masters because they think that will give them an edge in the economy. <laughs> Does that reflect in the in the data? So it, it it reflects only you know when you apply job. Suppose you you are doing masters in two different field, you can apply in two different fields job. That's the only thing. But uh, when as an employer, I'm going to hire a person. You know, I will uh, I will try to find a uh, best best person in that particular field. Mm -hmm. If you are master of all, no, sorry, jack of all, master of none, then uh, you you might lose the competition. Because mm -hmm. suppose I want to hire a data scientist, I will try to find out who is who is good at that particular uh, task. So uh, one student is just doing data science, you know, masters, and one student have done both data science and something else, other enge engineering. So if the student is equally good both the, in both the field then then it's okay but if the the person is not that much good in data science so he will lose the competition uh, compared to the special uh, the guy who, who is good at so if you can be good at two different things then it's okay then just that's fine but if you are just mediocre in both the field then you, you are not helping yourself you're harming yourself okay okay so so mediocre, there is no place for mediocre in this economy. You have to, you have to be very, very good. Okay. So now going into COVID, similar mm -hmm. question, but in the framework of COVID, sometimes like when people were talking about the 2008 crisis, they said that you should stay in school as much as, as long as possible mm -hmm. and then come into the economy when the uh, situation is good. Okay. What is your take? So should people wait and like go into a PhD program? Maybe if they're undergrad, go into a master's program. Um, or should they, what is there data that backs this notion that you should stay in school longer um, until the economy is good? What's your take on that? So there are a lot of papers, um, people study about this topic that if somebody graduated uh, in a recession time, someone graduated so his or her lifetime income is much lower compared to um, somebody who you know graduated in a in a boom economy okay so this this is in general okay so whoever graduated in 2008 and 9 recession that that was a you know that affects their lifetime income because they, they start with a low salary so the the time is very different 2008 recession and 2020 uh, in in one sense that the recession right now is not about just it's, it's a it's a shock it's a demand shock all of a sudden people are not you know demanding too many goods because uh, they're not going out they are just trying to uh, buy the things which is only necessary good, good right now so this is a you know huge shock in the demand for example uh, people are not traveling a lot so airline industry or hotel industry is almost you know dying Mm -hmm. you don't want to go to a restaurant and, and be exposed so restaurant industry is also badly affected so this is a demand shock but 2008 recession was not like that 2008 recession was because of a housing bubble in the economy so mm -hmm. all of a sudden uh, people you know, gave a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, loan to bad lenders and what happened in that since they cannot repay the back repay back so there is a huge debt in the economy and that burst out so these two times are very different you know you have to understand this the how the economy is affected because of these two events is very very deep and the question coming back so whether this is a good time for you to you know graduate or should you stay in school or not so hopefully these things will not for it and last forever it's you can see that People are in, in a state right now where uh, they are almost careless. You know, it's like eight months, seven months already over. So they, some, you know, some young people, they think that I don't care about whether I'll get COVID or not because the you know, mortality rate for the young people are getting uh, lower and lower. So within six months or a year, this stage will come to everybody. You know, 
that you cannot stay home forever. This is like whether I'll die or not, you know, staying home is, is not the solution forever. So hopefully things will come out. And once a lot of people will immune, this spread will you know, go down. And hopefully the you know, vaccine will come out soon within a couple of months. So economy will try to get back to its normal. So mm -hmm. if, if you, you know, have to go to, uh, if you have to graduate this time, you know, obviously this is not the right time. But being in school for next, suppose I'm talking about being in school for next two years or five years, if you're not interested about doing study, you know, you're just spending a lot of money to be in school for two years, that may not be the right strategy. So what is the best strategy people do is that when uh, they graduate from in a recession, the best strategy, remember that you need to switch your job. Suppose somebody, you know, got a job, low salary job right now, you know, just graduated this year or, or coming year. So when the economy will, you know, come back to its normal position or our economy will do well, so there will be a lot more opportunities. So you have to switch your job. You should not stay in that job forever. Okay. Obviously, if you cannot get a job, you know, going back to school is, is the easiest option. Okay. So that, that option is always there. But if you, if you can get out of, if, if, if you suppose you're not interested about doing PhD, you're a master's student, this is a commitment for five years. You know, it, it's not an easy, easy task. Everybody can, are not uh, you know, good enough to do PhD. You know, this, is, this is the true, true fact. So if somebody is just being in, in, a, in a gradual to stay for a couple of years, that may not be the right strategy. Rather than you know, if you can find a job, whatever job you get, and then try to switch the job. That could be in long run much better option because you are, if you if you are paying school, you are also losing money. Right. So okay, interesting. So uh, so then kind of shifting gears because this this talk will be posted online for people who may be considering coming to OU from India. Yeah. So yeah. they might be considering applying to different master's programs, and but this is a difficult time. What do you think are the safest fields right now during a recession and just generally? But I think as you're saying, 2020 recession is different from the previous ones. So what do you think right now are the safest fields if someone's like, you know, I have a variety of skills, I'm good at math, I'm good at humanities. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for something that I know will be safe. What do you think people should uh, consider so, when applying for a master's program? I, I think the safest field would be in next, not only just now, in next 10, 15, 20 years, uh, would be two uh, sectors. Uh, one is the energy sector. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the sector will grow a lot. And number two is AI and machine learning, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So these are the two sectors will grow so much, at least, you know, economists feel that in the next 20, 30, 40 years, because people's lifestyle is not going to go down. You know, lifestyle means, you know, they will use so much energy, every single individual. So we need to create a lot of energy. So we need sustainable energy. You know, we cannot rely on, on natural sources like coal, gas. Mm -hmm. So we have to use solar energy. We have to use renewable energy. And this is where a lot of money will be invested next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So this is one sector uh, will grow. And, and when this sector is growing, you know that technology will be a big part. So obviously an associate you know, technology related to from energy sector will, will be a huge demand over the next 10, 20, 30 years. The next thing will be, and, and this the wave is already here, uh, it's called artificial intelligence. And machine learning you know data science is a part of machine learning you can think of so because we have so much data these days you know whatever you're doing every single thing are somehow captured in in, in some companies are capturing this data okay all the things whichever website you are going whatever wherever you're going you know your, your phone is tracked every single thing is for almost you know billions of people you know i don't know how many people are using smartphone these days but all those data are collected. Somebody in the back of the curtain is, is collecting this data. So people, they will need a lot of, lot of people to analyze those data. It's just not about analyzing those data. It, it's about what information we can extract from this data. 
So this is where this machine learning. So it's not just one individual will, you know, or, or individual people will, will do this job. It's about uh, it's about machine will try to extract those information. So and also you can see that artificial intelligence is coming, uh, you know, or, or playing a big role over the next uh, next already started and it will play a big role over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, many, many jobs in the economy, 45% uh, of people are saying that 45% of the jobs uh, in current economy may be replaced by artificial intelligence. For example, all the truck driver, you know, if you have automated car, uh, you don't need a, a truck driver, you know, those kind of jobs will be gone. And in, in a big manufacturing sector, uh, in a car or, or, or aircraft in you know, a manufacturing sector what is happening there is that they are uh, they are done the most of the jobs or manual jobs are done by the big big machines you know artificial is the, the robots are, are, are creating a car these days robots are creating you know mm -hmm. making the most of the jobs in making aircraft so this kind of jobs and things are already you know started in in a big manufacturing sector but the next thing they're trying to do is that introduce this kind of you know artificial intelligence or robots in our day-to-day -day life. For example, if you go to uh, go to a restaurant, you know, in 10 years, 20 years, you might find that some robot will, will take your order. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, robot will take your order and, and give, give the food to you. So in that case, the person who was doing that kind type of job, manual uh, job, will be replaced. Somebody is in a cleaning dishes. You can see that, you know, those jobs, uh, you still need uh, people to, you know, put the plate in, in, in the you know, dishwasher, but those jobs can be also replaced. So many, 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 you know, manual task intensive jobs might be, you know, not might be, will be replaced in next 15, 20 or 30 years. So this is, this is where people are spending a lot of money to replace this kind of work because that will bring a lot, lot more efficiency. So these three sectors, artificial intelligence, machine learning, including data science uh, and energy sector. So there, I, I believe that it's not about just me, uh, many, 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 Economists will agree with me that this sector will be the largest and uh, growing sector in the next decades or so. Anybody who, who is interested about this uh, this kind of job will, I hope, uh, they will be highly benefited because of this economy. Interesting. Um, so, talking about the uh, Indian situation. So uh, we're talking, we've already talked about certain fields that are booming. And I think these fields are booming across the world. Yes. Uh, so sometimes, especially in an economy like this, you might be trying to get a job. And especially with, you know, your visa restrictions and stuff, you might be like, yeah, I'll just go back to India, right? Maybe, uh, and a lot of people pre-COVID, people were saying, we saw a lot of reverse brain drain back into India, right? There were a lot of people who were going back into hubs like Bangalore, Mumbai, Delhi, and starting startups there from abroad because they thought that this is a developing economy. And many of these fields like data science, like uh, engineering, energy, they're booming in India more so than they might be in the US. So right. now we've, we've had COVID, right? And there, we've seen retractions in the economies around the world. And I think just last quarter, India's economy retracted by 24% uh, about that, right? So um, what is what should be that calculus now for an Indian international student who says, maybe my job prospects might be better in India with my skill set, or maybe I should stay here, what, how is that comparison between a developed economy like the US versus an emerging economy like India? So India, yeah, India is still an emerging country. So in terms of you know, market structure, in terms of infrastructure, India is still uh, far behind the US. So if someone, you know, someone is very ambitious, uh, just uh, not about you know, working for his own, uh, for a firm, but someone really wants to uh, have his own or her own form and uh, create something big, you know. So I think uh, US still is a preferable location than, than India in terms of, you know, the bureaucratic uh, infrastructure in India is, is very different compared to here. So mm -hmm. if you really want to do something big, um, you might have a lot more friction uh, compared, 
compared to coming uh, compared to in the US. But in US, the only big problem for international students is that their visa and the government is making uh, even things are tougher over the, over the years. So, so that might you know that might encourage some people to go back and and, and start up something new there. Um, but you can get a job. You know, I'm not worried about getting a job. You know, if if you if you're uh, if you're a good engineer or you're good at your job, you know, at your field, uh, you will get a job. The question is if you want to think beyond, and uh, not just you know job right now, five years later, ten years later, what do you want to do in your life? If you really want to you know, have a very big dream, I think still US would be a preferable uh, location, just because uh, just because the infrastructure and and all the uh, you know the corporate structure is very very different. The culture is very very different mm -hmm. compared to uh, any developing countries, because US uh, market is very efficient, no doubt about that. If you see all the big innovations are coming from US, it's not about just you know a luck. You can see that you know Google, Apple, uh, you know Microsoft, even Tesla, and all those big innovation over the last 50, 30, 50 years is are coming from US. So if you really want to think big, uh, think big something, uh, you really have faith in yourself. You might have get some difficulty in the beginning of getting visa, thing you know or or getting the right visa, getting a job. But once you overcome this initial hurdle, this might might be a, a good place to you know pursue a dream. Uh, India is getting better. I'm not saying that India is 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 not a country to go back, but uh, I think it will still take some time, still take some time to catch up in, first of, in, in terms of all other aspects. Uh, because as long as the country is not, uh, it's not about just you know one sector, the, the moment you try to build something, is the entire country, you know, infrastructure matter. Mm -hmm. How how from where you're you know, finding people to do some work, how how the you know road system is there, mm -hmm. how the housing price there, all the things will play a, a big role. So uh, it's 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 obviously it's up to the that person's call whether to you know start something here or going back there, but. If you are good enough, have faith, you, you will good and get good job. Because in this economy, you know, there's a huge demand for skilled worker. Huge demand for skilled worker. Uh, if you're good, you're going to get a good job in, in Google. I know uh, people are, are looking for you know, people, you know Amazon are, are hiring every single day. Yeah, Amazon is hiring in you know, a good people, good engineer. So there is demand. It's it's all about you have to be good at good at that. And Interesting. So you're saying even now in this COVID economy that there is demand for these high skill workers in these fields that you talked about earlier. So the demand is even more right now. The demand is even more because uh, because the COVID thing is helping in you know, a big technological uh, technological firm like Amazon. Mm -hmm. Amazon is one of those companies who got so much you know, benefit because of this COVID thing. Uh, all the other firms are when uh, shutting down. Uh, JC Penney, you know, Macy's, they are bankrupted, and all those sales are people are now buying even clothes from Amazon. People are buying everything from Amazon. So they need more to manage everything. So Amazon is hiring. You know, think about uh, we spend more time in, in these days on technology. Uh, so mm -hmm. Google will be benefited. Microsoft will be benefited. So many many firms are benefited because of the COVID. So demand for specific skilled worker has gone up. It's not that if you look at the average demand for worker, that might go down. But I'm mm -hmm. talking about specific skill, uh, skilled worker who are needed in this economy. Their demand has gone up and will go up So over mm -hmm. the years too. So as long as you're developing a skill or a skill set that is in demand during the econ this economy, it doesn't yeah. matter if it's a good economy or a bad economy, you will, you'll have ample opportunities. You have and it will increase over time. The reason is, as I said, three sectors are booming, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and energy sector. And people, uh, these sec three sectors, it's not about just farm, I'm talking about the industry, the sector will need more and more and more skilled workers over the years. Interesting. Okay. So we have a few, few people who joined us uh, later on. So I just want to um, talk about 
uh, asking questions because I think we'll now transition into questions that other people are asking. Um, so you can ans ask a question in the chat and uh, Shireen will, uh, will track those or you can unmute yourself right now and ask a question. Um, so feel free. Um, Shireen, is there any, are there any questions in the chat right now? Yes, so we have two questions in the chat right now. The first one would be, um, what would you suggest would be the good way to build connections to the industry? What would be the, what coming in? Uh, sorry. How would you suggest to build some good connections in the industry? Good connection. This I wish I, I could uh, have a good answer for this question. So good connection is, is all about you know, personal skill, you know. There is no unique way. Obviously, you know when you go to good school, that that's the advantage of that. That you, the, your colleagues or, or your peer students or faculty, they know good people. So the only resources you have, you know, if, you, if obviously if you have any personal connection, that that's good. But you should talk to uh, faculties in, in the school, and if they know some people in the industry, you know, a lot of students, a lot of students are are graduated in, from OU over the years, uh, and some of them are from the faculty still in, in OU. So if you can track those students, you know, uh, suppose you talk to your Professor A and Professor A has five students in, in Amazon, 10 students in Google or, or some other firms. If you can you know, track those students and uh, just send them email because you are, you know, that's, that's a one connection you are making, you, you, both, both of you are from OU. But this is it's all about that. This is all about, you know, personal connection. You have to go to a different, not party, a different event where you can you can introduce yourself, talk to people. So there is no unique way. You know? There is no mm -hmm. unique. Way. Obviously, these days you have uh, the uh, the LinkedIn and other other stuff. This way, but people uh, you, you can you know you can send them email or, or message. But these days, if you are not personally connected to somebody, you know, there is no personal connection. It's very very difficult people to respond. I get so many emails, you know. People are busy. It's not about they, they just don't want to respond. If you get 15 emails, you know, from like that, uh, uh, unknown people. So normally people don't reply. So that's nothing wrong. You, you can try doing that, but success rate is very small. But you should always try to see what connection you can make through OU, through the OU faculties, through the OU friends. Uh, anything you can, you know, exploit the resource you have right now rather than just shooting, you know, to, uh, shooting unknown people uh, mm -hmm. and, and try to make connection. That might not help, uh, might not be most efficient way. Okay. So, connection yeah. is very important, very important. You know, yeah. I wish, you know, there is a good answer. So again, this goes back to your first point when you say that not only good grades and developing those skills, but equally important, and I think what you're saying is even more important, is working on those networking skills. So exactly probably throughout your uh, throughout your career, not just at the end, exactly. the skills. Exactly, exactly. So I think maybe if there's one quote unquote answer for that, it may be from what you're saying is working on those skills from the beginning. So yes. Working, interacting with faculty and finding connections when you come to OU, not just when you're about to graduate and you have to look for a job, right? Because that makes... Uh, issues for visa purposes, so many other things, right? So I think if there's exactly. one answer that I, I've learned from you right now, it's- Yes, yes, hard. it takes time, it takes time. It's not all of a sudden, you know, uh, you need something, you ask, ask the people, uh, that doesn't help. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to make this connection over the years, slowly build up things, you know. If you just need something, you ask something, people figure out that this guy is using me. So this is, there is a certain difference, right, you know. Mm -hmm. People should not feel that, you know, this guy is just using me for this purpose, one, this purpose, so over this guy will, will have, have no connection with me. So you have to do it over the years, just not that last moment, you're right, completely agree with you. Interesting, okay. So uh, Shireen, are there, is there another question? Yes, so our next question is, does eight plus years of Indian experience count in USA market? Eight plus what experience? Experience. So I think they're saying that does experience in the in, in India or in, in the Indian market count when you're applying for a job here? Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. 
Yeah. Any any experience, any experience help, uh, especially in that particular uh, related field. Obviously, it helps. Uh, this. So, so yeah. so someone shouldn't be scared of like you know what I, I did it, I worked for this firm in India, but I don't know if people will recognize that or people will know that I have those skills. You're saying right, that. Right. That, that always yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, I was working for hp before coming to graduate school so i think it helped it, it helped me a lot uh, mm -hmm. so if you have some experience try to sell that experience it's not about just you know work eight years uh, so as i said in the first thing in, in today's talk that you have to make things so simple how your experience is helping to the employer so obviously, I don't know what you have done in eight years. So obviously, you have learned so many things. You have done so many projects. So simplify that and then tell to the employer, these things will help this, the, the learning thing I have done over eight years will, will be beneficial for you. The moment the employer find that is beneficial, then it makes sense your eight year, years will count. If you just say, I'm, I have done eight years work and whatever I have done, if it's not related to to the employer, you know, whatever the skills they are looking for, then it, it might not be useful. So it's your job to sell yourself. Mm -hmm. It's always good having experience on something. Yeah. So again, today's theme. So even if you have eight, eight plus years in, in India, you should be able to sell that experience when you come yeah. to a, a American employer. Okay. Interesting. Any other questions that we have for Dr. Ghosh? Yeah, please go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Um, so this is kind of just like uh, to hear your thoughts and stuff, because I'm not an international student, but I know like a lot of people are. So what are your thoughts on like this administration kind of increasing the prevailing age uh, or wage and making it harder for like the H-1B uh, visa people? And like, um, how do you think that's going to affect the economy? Is there any way that like international students can like prepare for this? What can they do? Like, so it's at most, you know, obviously it's making harder, right? I think initially it was like 88,000 salary cap. Right now they're trying to make it 127 or something, $127,000. So obviously, you know, if now there is two things, this is given by the government, you know, 127,000 salary cap. Uh, individual student can have no control over this. Now, how much a salary will be offered? It is also uh, it's coming from a farm. Students have no control over it or individual workers have no control over it. So only way, uh, the question is when a farm will give you uh, 90,000 or when a farm will give you 130,000 instead of 90,000. If the farm can extract more money from you over the years, suppose, mm -hmm. so if I can hire a person, even I pay them $130,000, and I still can make more money, then I'll hire, right? Mm -hmm. If I can make only $100,000 from, from a, a worker uh, or student, I will never pay that student $127,000 or $130,000. So then once you combine these two information, it boils down that a student have to be so good or so productive that his, uh, his contribution One thirty thousand. So, if if you think of you know only better student or, or good quality student can contribute one thirty thousand dollar, they will stay in this country. The below those students, you know, in terms of ability, if you can think of that way, those students uh, are not that good enough who cannot generate one thirty thousand dollar for a firm, will not be hired by firm, right? So, what the government is trying to do is just uh, keeping those international students who are very good enough or, or in terms of dollar values like one thirty thousand dollar so if you cannot uh, generate that money in the economy for a firm uh, the government is, say, is saying that then you sh you should not or you are not supposed to be in this country so obviously it is unfortunate because many students will fall in that you know below that range and unfortunately, uh, if the firm will not hire them, it's nothing the firm's fault. The firms will never hire somebody, you know, who is not that good enough to, you know, or pay you know, $130,000. So those people will be eliminated from the US labor market because of this you know, visa thing. Interesting. 
Okay, it's so fortunate. Uh, so, you, so you're saying that we should develop those skills so that someone sees us, and perhaps I've I've heard from other people online that say that maybe you should um, uh, you should aim for jobs that Americans may get paid a hundred uh, like. Hundred fifty thousand or two hundred thousand, and right. then even then, um, if you get paid hundred thirty thousand base salary, mm-hmm. you may be uh, a, yeah, a competitive is. candidate for that kind of job. Yes, in this yes. situation. Yes, yes, it's just not about one hundred twenty seven because a uh, way firm hire an international student and file for H one B is like five thousand dollar extra. So one hundred twenty seven plus five one hundred thirty three thousand dollars. So you have to be really good enough, you know, to get that kind of job. So so that people uh, will hire you, and then the visa thing will not be an you know bar to to cut off you mm. from the country. Okay. And someone has another question. Uh, Shereen. Uh- the next question that was asked is, what is the process of taking faculty route after PhD and what are the visa issues one faces then? So that's the easiest uh, route if you, um, because faculty uh, or nonprofit organization, they are, uh, they are not bound to that cap. You know, every year uh, US government has a cap, 85,000 or 115,000, depending on the government's policy, you know, they have the cap of H-1B. You cannot you know, have more than, I suppose, 150,000 H-1B. But if you work for a faculty, for, for a school, or any non-profit organization, so your H-1B will not be, you know, capped on that, uh, on that number will not enter in that $150,000. I'm sorry, 150,000 cap. So, so there are unlimited numbers of, you know, uh, H-1B for, for faculties. And, so this is a good route. You, know, you don't have to worry about uh, worry about H one B ever if you if you work for a uh, faculty. But uh, at the same time, you have to remember one thing. This is is it seems like an easy, but it's not the easiest uh, route because uh, there are a lot less jo- faculty jobs compared to corporate job. So if you want to be a faculty, you have to first finish your PhD, and even if you finish your, your PhD. Um, only 5% to 10% people will get faculty job. The, the 90% other people will not get faculty jobs because there are only a few, uh, demand is much lower, right? Suppose in, in a given year, there are 100,000, just an example, suppose 500,000 uh, corporate job, whereas the faculty job will be only 30,000. So obviously you see that the competition is severe, very, very severe. And in faculty job, it's not only about uh, only international you know, students are applying, you know, domestic students who are good, they're also applying for faculty job, right? Faculty job is something who are really passionate about the subject. They try to stay in the, in the, in the faculty uh, job or, or try to be a, be a professor. So in that profession, good thing about it is that is very safe. Uh, but bad thing, one, one thing is that you will not get enough salary compared to your, uh, your colleague you know, who work for, for a firm. Obviously, the you know, salary will be much lower. Mm-hmm. If you for big firms, is it so you have to make. But remember one thing: if you want to be a faculty, not just because of visa, don't don't make that mistake. It's your career. You have to live with that job for the rest of your life. Suppose, so you have to love that. You have to love that job. If you do not love this job, a teaching would be a. a a torture, right? <laughs> you have to, you have to feel the passion of teaching as well as doing research. You know, interesting. So you have to make that call. So would you say that those fields that you talked about, they that translates the same to faculty jobs? So if you, if you're thinking of becoming a faculty member, do you think that those fields like machine learning, uh, AI? those fields are also increasing in faculty positions or what's, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. what's the situation in the academic field? I, I think it will, it will. So it's, you know, it's like a circle uh, when there is huge demand, when, when they see that 
there's many, many students who want to be get graduate in energy sector uh, or energy related fields. Many, many students are really, uh, want to study AI or machine learning. Obviously then, you know, university have to find people to teach those classes. So, so it's, it's a circle, you know, once you have enough demand, you know, uh, farm or in this in this case farm means the school or university they will uh, try to find you know fill up those gap by hiring people so there will be demand for uh, faculties too so it's, it's just a circle. circle okay we have i think one more question and i think we're coming up to the hour so let's um if you have any questions please um say them now so shireen so our next question is, if someone is just looking to utilize OPT period and not H-1B sponsorship, what option can we select while applying for jobs, which require a sponsorship option? So yeah, that's a technical. So you uh, need, uh, no, I just, I, because I, I have gone through this process. So the question, let me understand the question. So if you need an OPT, Mm -hmm. uh, so, so if someone is just looking to utilize OPT period and not mm -hmm. the H-1B sponsorship, what mm -hmm. option can we select while applying for the job that require sponsorship option? I guess ask for a sponsorship option. So once you use the OPT option, you know, for the farm, you should be very, very careful that whether they are interested about you to you know, hire if uh, you are using OPT for a farm and that farm does not hire you, then you are losing your valuable time and this OPT opportunity too. So you have to make sure that you go to those farms. You know, there is a opportunity that sometime, you know, once this OPT time will go over like 18 months for maybe a STEM student or two, two years old. I don't know how, what is that right now, the current date. So once those time period is over, uh, you know, you have to be uh, very, very careful that at least you know the, that farm or related industry, you know farms in the industry will will hire you. Those experience will be valuable. For example, suppose I'm using OPT for a, a mechanical engineering farm, and then uh, I'm I'm a computer science engineer. So if my OPT is over, and that that experience will not count, so that would be a big blow for you for a career. So you have to find out OPT job which is which will help you to find a good job or at least you know the best outcome would be you get the job in that particular form mm -hmm. once the opt is over so be careful you know don't use opt just just because you, you have to stay in, in, a, in the country okay the, the worst option is always you, you can stay in school remember you can take one year extra education uh, so sometimes that might help you to find in you know, a better job after one year rather than using your OPT. Uh, and then I guess as uh, many things about job, finding jobs, mm -hmm. that original um, advice of yours to network more is important in that case, just so that you don't have to use that OPT period, you find a, you can find the sponsorship quickly. Yeah. Uh, okay, interesting. So any other questions that we uh, our members have, we have quite a few people online right now. So ask, ask away before we, uh, well, we have Dr. Ghosh with us right now. Any such questions? Any questions? So I have one question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm Ravi. Yeah. Hi, Hello, Ravi. everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know in 2008, when unemployment took place, when the world went into recession, there was like 10% and all. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that US actually recovered from the unemployment rate up till 2019? What are the data like? Did US recover or is it still above the, the point before 2008? Like I think so 3% before 2008 and it just came to 4%. Do you believe US recovered? That's my first question. And if it recovered, when will US recover from the current uh, unemployment rate, which is around 6%, I guess? Right now, I think more than 10, maybe, yeah. Uh, uh, so oh, 8.5, sorry, 8.5. 8. 8. Okay. okay, so your first question is whether US ever recovered from that uh, US recession. Yeah. yeah, 
I think so. I think so. U.S. economy was booming uh, uh, since 2013-14. If, if you see, it took two to three years to come out from the recession. You know, once I think in 2011 and 12, U.S. get back to normal state, and then uh, over the last seven, eight years, you know, from 2012 to 2019, the U.S. economy is booming. Uh, it's not just about you can think of only unemployment rate that uh, statistics. Economy is booming in terms of creating jobs, you know, many, many jobs uh, were created over this time time period. Uh, you can also see that uh, stock market, uh, people uh, people you know, invest so much money in the stock market, a lot of, uh, lot of firms become uh, in a tr trillion dollar firms. So uh, once a firm becomes so big, it, it just shows that they can hire a lot more people. So, you know, a lot more skilled people, you know. So this is, this is a good, this was a good thing. So the seven, eight years, especially, you know, once uh, Donald Trump become president, US over the last three, four years, 2016, 2019, that time period, that was a very booming period. So it's not because of Trump and Trump was the, was the government, it's a you know, market friendly government, but the, the things were reaping uh, or things were starting doing well in, in, in the 2012, 13, 14, in that time period. And you can see the, the boom from 2016. So before even COVID, if you, if you look at the economists were thinking that the market is so, you know, uh, so high at that time, there could be a recession, not because of COVID. Nobody thought about COVID in 2019 that is going to uh, affect our economy. But the market was so high that people was thinking that, uh, people were thinking that there could be another recession uh, because the market was so high. Uh, you know that in everything there is a cycle. The market cannot be very good situation for a, for a long, long time. If it happens at some point, it will uh, the economy will will go to the recession again. Come back. This is a cycle. Every ten years, if you look at six uh, last sixty years, every ten years you will have a recession. In 80, 82, 81, you have a recession. In ninety one, you have a recession. Two thousand, two thousand one, you have a recession. Two thousand eight, you have a recession. And this is another recession. So every t eight to ten years, this is this is called business cycle. You will have a recession. So recession is a normal thing. It could come from different reason. So nothing. Uh, um, nothing's you know surprising that economy is in recession. So first first question, yes, economy was booming. Uh, and the, your second question is our first question answer is yes, econ economy uh, recovered from the 2008 recession and, and doing much better compared to 2008, you know 2006, seven that time period you know, was much better uh, in terms of different types of jobs were created, especially skilled workers uh, economy. So, and then the second question was uh, whether uh, and when this economy will come out. So it all depends on, on right now, the economy is in recession uh, or in a bad situation because of demand shock. And demand shock will not go away unless people think it is, it, it, you know, COVID thing is, is no longer a threat for their life. For example, once people start feeling that, you know, you can safely uh, go to a public place you know, or join a public event, you can travel. So once you, you, you feel those threat is, uh, those threat is no longer, you know, there in the economy, people will go back to normal activity and then economy will be in, in the normal stage. But it's on the, or it depends on all those pharmaceutical company when they will figure out, they will find out a good vaccine and make people immune from this disease. And I don't know when the way because it, nobody's giving any assurance that it's going to happen in the next two weeks. But as long as you know, as long as there is a hope, uh, and we hope that the vaccine will, will come out at some point uh, within within six to eight months, it will take to immune people. It it may not you know it, the day you know vaccine come out of the market the next day everything will be fine. But hopefully you know once. Uh, once they distribute those vaccines, hopefully it will, it will work first, uh, and then they will distribute uh, this vaccine over the throughout the globe. You know, it takes six to eight months, one year maybe, and then you will see that things will be normal. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, as long as uh, people are rational, they will come out from the home, they will do the normal activity. Economy will will be fine. I hope so. I have yeah. continuation. I have a continuation to the first question again. Yeah. Like yeah. 2008, okay, 
naturally every country recovered eventually so which country took the most advantage of that or which country as per you came out the strongest from there i know there was fundamentals issue fundamentals that led to the recession as you said housing bubble mm-hmm. right now those fundamentals were not present it was just the pandemic but mm-hmm. at that time who took the most advantage because so, we knew where the housing bubble was there so in, in terms of which economy was growing first uh, since 2008 recession obviously you can pick out you know china india these are the these are the you know, growing economy in the world uh, you know china india some other developing country might be but at the same time us was not doing bad us and you know, think about when us has such a big economy the growth rate may be very small like 2% 1 or 2, 1% or 2% or 3% but the base value is so high for economy like us even they are growing like 2.2.5% and uh, that that's a very good number so but if you took a look at the absolute absolute value uh, china was china was the leader china's economy grew so much uh, over the last 10 years 15 years is because china captured the global uh, manufacturing sector most of the stuff is not about just us these days all the things people are using 60 to 70% is, you know things that are are coming from china so people are demanding more goods over the years once your income is increasing you are, you are asking more and more goods and oh, if those goods are coming from china china will be highly benefited and us sorry india took the service sector in a huge portion of the service sector you know india's uh, cheap labor in terms of engineer you know engineers uh, so they they provide service for for big firms so india's economy is also highly affected or highly benefited because of that but uh, the rest of the country is nothing because of because of 2008 recession every country has their own growth path because countries are different what is working in china uh, will not work for you know some other countries in 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 northern europe and northern europe so every every country has their own growth path you know in growth stage growth has also a cycle so economy eventually will will follow its natural uh, or, or a country's growth will follow its natural path this kind of small shock will come and go go but ultimately whether a country will grow or not it depends on what is what is uh, what is the infrastructure they have you know and as well as you know how well they are in terms of you know trade uh, every you know every year uh, or or, or in, if you take a 10 years time period some some goods will be more you know the demand for some goods will go up and if you can take that big portion using the trade then your economy will grow first for example suppose the technology technology thing will be an iphone or a computer these things will will uh, will grow and a demand for these things will go up in next 5 years or 10 years it's happening for last 10 years too but if you can produce those goods you know your economy will be will take the big share from the global in a global market a china china is producing most of those goods so china is you know benefit getting benefited because of that taiwan is specialized on doing high tech uh, high tech uh, sector for example if you uh, if you use uh, micro na- na- nanometer chip you know you, you know better than me all those things so taiwan is one of those the industry leader so if uh, next 10 years people are you know having those type of you know, good you uh taiwan will benefit so we'll try to grow in, in, in now it's a global competition it's not about just competitive competition with, with a small firm um or, or among the small firms in, in a local uh, geography so i i would say that china and us was benefit uh, were benefited a lot but some other countries uh, you know will be benefited because of this uh, covid thing uh, because technology will be very 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 important part of our life it is already but it will be even increasingly more important and what happened is that if some country can take that and and in a global market uh, win the win this competition to produce the, those type of good uh, they will be highly benefited too yes thank, thank you. you thank you for the insight yeah. um so i just wanted to ask dr gosh like because mm-hmm. we've come to the around the end of our time 
So uh, we have one, I think one question left if you're available to answer that. Otherwise mm -hmm. we can wrap up right now. Up to you. Sure, sure, sure. No, no worries. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we have one question from uh, Medellin. She's asking, how, how does the economy change during, after an election and what changes should we anticipate slash prepare for uh, as a result of the coming election? So if someone's thinking of graduating, maybe in December, uh, what should there be some serious considerations that they should have because of the election? So this is a very good question. So government has a huge role, you know, uh, for, for international student, a government has an extra role of this visa thing. You know? So uh, election, uh, if the government stays the same, then uh, hopefully the same policy will be again you know implemented and that uh, strict visa policy so it, it will affect a lot of international students but uh, more or less farms are very independent you know uh, like how google will work how amazon will work uh, it does not depend that i mean their activities do not depend on on you know whether democrat government will be the power or republicans but uh, if you have a government which uh, takes, and you know, Biden might do that. Biden said that you know they will take uh, or impose tax on on very very high income people. You know, suppose somebody is earning one billion dollar. You know, Biden is going to take uh, more taxes from these kind of rich people. Initially, this might affect the economy a little bit, but it will be beneficial. You know, if the government use that money in a proper, you know proper way. That's what you know, we, we hope, you know, they're taking money from the billion years. And if they use that money for education, infrastructure, eventually, you know, you may not see the effect in 10 days, one month, six months, eventually that will help to grow the economy. So to answer that question, you know, in short run, you will not see any effect on whether you know democratic government or, or republican government is there unless you know, it's a visa thing and you know, a visa thing is, is very difficult you know it, it, it will affect a lot of students you know getting job in the us but i'm talking about in general suppose visa thing is not there whether it's democratic government or republican government within short time period within graduate it will not affect that much but it will eventually affect and the right policy will affect to grow the country in the long run, it takes five years or ten years. So you need to have the right government who 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 thinks about the future, you know, and, and make the policy such a way that you will still be the global leader in ten years, and just not uh, you know short term short term thinking. So don't worry about election that much, you know. If only thing focus on, uh, I always say that focus on the things you can control. You try to be good at the things you, you, you are studying. If you are good, the economy is good enough to you know offer you many, many good things, I mean, good job offers. So, but you remember one thing, you know, if there is many, if there are many, many jobs in the economy, but if someone is not good enough, you know, that person will not get the job. Just because there are jobs, people are not going to hire someone who is not good enough to get that job. So that's what happened in academics. There's some some year, you know. Suppose we, we try to hire a person, but if we find that person, you know, there's not enough good people to fill up the vac vacancy, uh, we're not hired that. Interesting. So, so you're you need to make yourself good enough so that you are worthy of jobs and forget about the rest of the things. If you're good enough, uh, you have a good future. No worries. Thank, Thank you. you. But uh, so I think we'll start to wrap up now. It's been an awesome conversation with you, Dr. Ghosh. I think we covered a lot of different issues that Indian students might be worried about and just generally international students might be worried about right now. Um, so I think people will get a lot of lessons, specific lessons and general lessons from um, hearing this. And we'll post this online for anyone who wants to refer to this. Later on, we will we will post this on our social media. Um, uh, so yes, thank you very much. I just thank you, really thank you for it was, it was really a good time. Uh, I had a really good time talking to you guys, and I'm very glad that you know 
I could help you some some way. You know, this is a tough time for everyone, especially young kids like you. Uh, this is uh, a really tough time. So just hang in there. Uh, you know, there's many many good opportunities are coming in your you know in, in your life. So just uh, just hang in. Tough time will uh, not last, but tough people will. So you are tough people, right? Yeah. So you, you just hang in there. You no, know? I'm sure things will be much better next year by this time. Well, okay. Take thank care. you very much. Um, so we will end this right now. Uh, and uh...